Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Welcome back. Um, we're going to go around the room and say our names. I'm George. I'm Grisha. My name is Henry. Charles. My name is Ray. Jerry. Stephen. Juan. Matthew. I'm Brad. Bob. My name is Cass. Jack. Gabore. Dave. Jim. And I'm Laura. Um, it looks like online we've got Jeff and Bob and Don and Michael, Marvin, Tony, Christian, Crisco, Wolf, Andreas, Jim, John, Joe, Steve, Michael, Rich, Nino. Did I get everybody? I hope I got everybody. Um, Yes, and I'll introduce Laura. Uh, we go. Laura Burgess, a lay and trusted Dharma teacher in the Soto Zen tradition, teaches classes, lectures, and leads retreats in Northern California. She received monastic training in Tassajara Zen Mountain Center. Uh, Laura co-founded the Sangha and Recovery Program at the San Francisco Zen Center and is the abiding teacher at Lennox House Meditation Group in Oakland. Mala Publications offers her Buddhist children's books, Buddhist Stories for Kids, and Zen for Kids. Her most recent book from Shambhala is The Zen Way of Recovery, An Illuminated Path Out of the Darkness of Addiction. And Laura lives in San Francisco. Welcome, Laura. Welcome back. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. It's, it's so lovely to sit still with you all in this oasis in the Mission District. Uh, in this crazy world. Um, I thought when we were sitting of the words of Dogen Zenji, who was the Japanese monk that founded Soto Zen uh, in the 12th century, and he said, the Zazen we speak of is not learning meditation. It is simply the Dharma gate of repose and bliss. And so it's wonderful to sit in bliss with all of you. Well, spring seems to be upon us. I uh, was walking in the botanical gardens at 9th and Lincoln the other day in the rain. There wasn't anybody there. And uh, I thought of the E.E. E. Cummings poem, This park's empty. Everybody's elsewhere except me, six sparrows, and the rain, the rain, the rain. <laughs> and we love this healing rain. Um, if you get a chance and you haven't been to see the, the magnolias are in bloom and the arboretum and the tulips, who says we don't have seasons in San Francisco? <laughs> you know, I said to the guy at the kiosk where they, you know, we get to go for free if we're residents of San Francisco, and I, for some reason I told him, when I was 19, I lived at six, on 6th Avenue, and sometimes I'd come over to the Arboretum in the middle of the night. I was so skinny I could squeeze through the bars. <laughs> and I would frolic, you know, in the Arboretum, knowing I was perfectly safe in there. So, um, uh, well, I was saying to a friend recently that when I came to Zen Center and I heard Buddha's teachings about sickness, old age, and death, I certainly didn't think they were talking about me. <laughs> that was in 1975, so... Uh, I have more understanding of that. I've, I've come to accept that we're all subject to these aspects of life. The Buddha taught that in life there is suffering, but there's also the potential to ease our self-created suffering by practicing the Buddha way. There is relief, especially from our self-created suffering that we throw up, our preoccupations, our excessive busyness, our uh, habitual negative thoughts we can turn in another direction through our practice. It's said that when the Buddha sat down under the Bodhi tree, 
that he was assailed by, by Mara. Mara is this conflictual being. And Mara brought forth armies and they shot arrows at the Buddha. And he looked at the arrows in the sky and they turned to flowers and fell to the earth. And finally he touched the earth. Mara said to him, who do you think you are to sit there like that? And the Buddha touched the earth and he held one hand to the sky as an affirmation of his inherent ability to wake up, which he shares with all of us, you know? Uh, and I, I, I don't think we have to imagine an, some external being that distracts us and can destroy us. It's right inside of us, this archetype of self-created, uh, self, uh, self-annihilation or self-sabotage uh, that we can bring upon ourselves. So Buddha's story is our own story, too. That's what I love about it. In fact, I was saying to somebody recently, I'm kind of a reluctant Buddhist because sometimes I wonder, what would the Buddha think about us all calling ourselves Buddhist, Buddhists? You know, the term Buddhism was coined, I think, in the 1800s. Up until that point, it was just called Dharma practice. And really what the Buddha taught us is to go our own way. And to he laid down a wonderful body of work of teachings that were transmitted orally for 400 years before they were written down by monks in Sri Lanka. But, but he, you know, his last words apparently were, you must be a lamp unto yourself. Although I've sometimes heard it, that his last words were, that pork could have been cooked a little bit longer. <laughs> I'd like to share a story from our Western tradition that that is such a beautiful acknowledgement of of this truth that we we can go into the dark and go into suffering and emerge bearing jewels as long as we keep our eyes wide open. So this is the story of Demeter and Persephone, a Greek myth. Demeter, as you probably know, was the goddess of the harvest and of the earth, and she lived on Mount Olympus with the other immortals. Always by her side was her beautiful daughter, Persephone. They went everywhere together. Persephone was the apple of her mother's eye. And when Demeter would come down to earth and uh, go into the fields and, and the waving of seas of wheat, she would bring Persephone with her. And Persephone, she just seemed to have a golden glow. Anyone who saw her couldn't help but smile. And, and when she walked in her footsteps, flowers would spring up. Well, it happened one spring that Demeter and Persephone were frolicking with the nymphs in the, under the flowering fruit trees. And Persephone got distracted and wandered off. She was picking some flowers. And uh, she didn't know that Hades, the god of the underworld, knew of her. He knew of her beauty and of her mysterious qualities and wanted her for his bride. So he was waiting and watching. And when she wandered off by herself, he came up just crashing up onto earth in his chariot with his two black horses and seized Persephone and descended back down into the underworld. And in the underworld, he installed her in a throne next to him on a hill overlooking the dark underworld of Hades' land. From there they could see the dead coming across the river Styx, each of the dead with a gold coin in their mouth to pay the boatman. And on the shores, on this side of the shores of the river Styx, the judge Radamanthus would judge these mortal beings for their behavior on earth. And they would be sent either to the Elysian fields, where there was perpetual light and joy, or confined for eternity to Hades' dark realm. Well, meanwhile, up on the earth and on Mount Olympus, Demeter was beside herself with grief. And she heard a rumor that Hades had seized her daughter and taken her to the underworld. So she went to Zeus, the king of the gods, and said to him, Nothing will grow or thrive on the earth until my daughter is returned to me. So Zeus sent his messenger Hermes into the underworld to confront Hades and to tell him to send Persephone back to her mother. Just at that moment, Hades' gardener 
held out his hand, and in his hand was a ruptured pomegranate with three of the jewel-like ruby-red seeds missing. Well, it said, if you descend into Hades and you eat the food of the dead, you're, you're, you have to stay there forever. But, but because Persephone had only eaten three of the seeds, the curse was softened. And she, she only had to return to Hades for three months out of the year, and the rest of the time could be with the other immortals and with her mother, and also roaming the earth and enjoying the fields and the tulips and the magnolias. Um, but she had her season in hell, three months. And that's the time when our crops lay fallow, when Demeter is missing her daughter. I, I love this story because I think each of us, if you haven't had your season in hell, you will. Each of us has had a dark and uh, troubling time in our life when the things we believed in and counted on were whisked away. Uh, Machi Gladron was a female Tibetan teacher. She was born in 1055. And Pema Chodron quotes her as saying, Approach what you find repulsive. Help the ones you think you cannot help. And go to the places that scare you. Uh, by going into these dark places, which are there for all of us human beings, this type of suffering, uh, we align ourselves with other suffering beings and, and we're be better able to live our bodhisattva vow to live for the benefit of all beings. Each of us in our human life will spend time in a dark, hellish place and it was a revelation to me that neither practice nor my recovery from alcohol abuse was a vaccination against suffering. You know, I thought, oh, from now on it's going to be smooth sailing because I cleaned up my act, but you know, that, wasn't, that wasn't the case. In fact, when I went to Tassahara for my monastic training, I thought, oh, this is great. Now I'll really be able to meditate, you know. But there was a creek that ran by the... Zendo, and, and and I would hear in that creek the sound of cocktail glasses clucking <laughs> and, and voices. And um, once, Sashin, I, I was visited by, I hate to say this to you because this is an earworm and it may revisit you later, but the theme song to the Flintstones <laughs> was running through my mind. You know, sometimes when we meditate, all the popular culture that's been stuffed into our brain, you know, comes, comes flowing out. Um, Go to the places that scare you. Makes it sound like it's an option, but we really don't have any choice. Whether we want to or not, uh, we have that season in hell. And, and to me, the good news is that practice isn't separate from those dark places. We turn towards the darkness and practice with it. We look at it clearly, and we, we might even say, there's my old friend, fear. There's my old friend, insecurity. There's my old friend, envy. You know? Um, we learn not to push these feelings away, but to turn towards them. Uh, this, this sort of what I call the soft heart of sadness of being alive. When my father, Terry Burgess, was dying of lung cancer, uh, he ran a little typing service uh, in, on Polk Street. And um, I picked up a call from one of my dad's clients, and it was this beautiful, mellifluous James Earl Jones voice. <laughs> And uh, he wanted my dad to type something for him. And I said, you know, I'm really sorry to tell you that my dad is going through the process of dying. And this man, who I never met, he said, I went through, I have goosebumps right now. I went through that with my father. And I want to give you some advice. Look for the jewels. I've never forgotten those words. Because if you've ever had the honor of accompanying someone through the process of dying... You know, there's laughter. There are stories. There are meaningful looks and grins, you know. And there were... My dad drank a lot when I was growing up, and he couldn't drink at the end of his life. And there was a wonderful clarity and transparency in him that I'd never known before. And we met on a very deep level. Those were the jewels of accompanying him uh, on his death journey. 
we'll all deal with our own illnesses and the illnesses of those we love, our own confrontation with death and of those we love. And in our everyday lives, sometimes we meet with success, sometimes failure, sometimes we feel sad or mad or incomplete. And if we stay with that soft heart instead of trying to flee or fix it or make it better, uh, we can see that this is what connects us to one another. It actually is the birthplace of empathy, right? Our wonderful poet Theodore Rothke said, in a dark time, the eye begins to see. In a dark time, the eye begins to see. And... um, my, my stepmother was dying of cancer at the same time as my father. And she asked me for a glass of water, and I brought it to her, and she, she drank it, and she looked up at me, and she said, I never knew how good a glass of water could taste. You know, that gift of appreciating that uh, came to her because of, of seeing the end. The end was in sight for her. Um, and that was such a teaching for me to, you know, no matter what, we can always appreciate a glass of water. Our, our practice can produce a profound transformation, transformation in the way we see the world. Uh, though we don't have much control over what happens to us, we do have control over the way we react to them. We can change the way we see things. We can emerge from the dark, bearing jewels, more prepared to help other beings. So if we've suffered grief, you know, we can speak with an open heart with others who are grieving. If we've recovered from an addiction, we have our own recovery to inspire and help others identify with us. We can keep a friend company as they walk through their own version of hell. We can say, I'm here for you. I've been there myself. And we can help ease the suffering of someone who's dying. When we feel overwhelmed, uh, as many of us do right now, by the chaos and troubles of the world, it's very helpful to just pick one or two things, ways we can help, and devote ourselves to those things. We can't take on everything. Suzuki Roshi, who founded the San Francisco Zen Center, said, shine one corner of the world. You know, pick one thing to do and do it wholeheartedly. And we can sit still every day. You know, in Soto Zen, our practice is to sit still with whatever arises, just sitting down in the middle of our lives. So what's up with you today? You know, what did you bring to the chair or the cushion? And I can ask myself, am I able to deeply accept whatever feelings and thoughts arise as I sit, touch them gently and let them go? You know, there's a saying about meditation that it's like, watching clouds in an endless sky? Or am I trying to push these things away and and make myself feel better? If I approach approach Buddhism as a way to fix myself or to become a better person, I did that for a long time. Uh, Because of my alcohol abuse, I was ashamed of who I was, and I just wanted to put on a black robe and chant in Japanese and be somebody else. But I had to turn around and confront my life and make amends to people I'd harmed and understand uh, the roots of my addiction. Um, using, using Buddhism as something that can, could fix me was a kind of outside-in thinking instead of an inside-out thinking. Um, if I use Buddhism in a kind of medi- mechanistic way, trying to fix myself or, or heal this wound of being alive, trying to get rid of the dark places or the parts of myself that I'm not comfortable with or that make me feel ashamed or or actually I want to reject. Um, My practice, when I tried to do that, was very stunted and small. And I know some of you might be in recovery. For me, once I entered the rooms of recovery, then my practice could flower because I was able to say, I'm Laura and I'm an alcoholic and address that shadow side of my life, you know. So we can even find and and bring love and compassion to the parts of ourself that we find repulsive. Uh, An antidote is to, in the words of Machi Globron, approach what you find repulsive, help the ones you think you cannot help, and go to the places 
that scare you, that's a really lively kind of practice. You know, and if you've done work feeding the homeless or working with uh, people less fortunate than you or uh, whatever you found to do in, in our troubled city, um, you also have to protect yourself in a way, have a little psychic distance, and your practice can be there with you. Buddhism teaches us that to be alive is to lose. Dogen Zenji said, life is one continuous mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Suzuki Roshi would say, life is like getting on a boat that's about to sail out to sea and sink. <laughs> and then he'd throw his head back and laugh. And yet Suzuki Roshi wasn't a grim man. He was very playful in spite of some really terrible tragedies that had happened in his life. I was walking through a downpour on Friday and... Suzuki's words, uh, I didn't get to meet him. He died right before I came to Zen Center, but he said this cryptic thing. He said, when you walk, don't hurry through the rain. It's raining everywhere. And I think what he meant by that is don't try to scurry away from suffering. It's always with us. You know, as long as we live in a human body, there's sickness, old age, and death. And yet we can always find joy and meaning in our lives, especially in meaningful work, in our creativity, in our deep connection with one another. These are the fountains of joy in our life. You may have had this experience that one moment or one day or one season, something or someone you loved deeply was just whisked away from you. You may have had some cherished belief that turned to ashes in your mouth. Someone leaves, someone Someone dies, your child becomes seriously ill. You're unjustly accused of some wrong. This happened to me a couple of times as a teacher where a mentally ill parent decided to project onto me all of their suffering, you know. Um, A life you've built around a job or an identity or a living space (coughs) suddenly vanishes or maybe you just feel that ordinary everyday Sadness, you know, that comes to us sometimes that we really can't explain. And, you know, I taught third grade for 35 years, and uh, I miss being with kids every day. And, you know, childhood is not a cloudy wonderland. You know, kids really have a difficult time sometimes. And my daughter, Nova, when she was eight years old, I was tucking her into bed, and my heart just stopped a little bit when she said to me, Mommy... Why are people born to suffer and die? She was eight years old. And I said something rather lame, like, uh, you know, sweetheart, this is a question people have been asking themselves ever since there have been people. She thought about it. She said, you know, Mom, that doesn't really help very much. Uh, I I used to ask a question of the day every day in third grade, and at the beginning of the year I'd ask them, what do you you wish for this year in third grade? And Casio, who was a very quirky kid, I just adored him, but he did have trouble fitting in with other kids. When I said, what do you expect from third grade? He says, time travel. (laughs) And I I think he really thought that was a possibility. (laughs) Probably get this with your kids, Grisha. The only place we can fully rest in is this moment. And whatever suffering's coming up in our life, usually in this moment we can say, well, right now I'm okay. Uh, So living deeply and richly and fully right now, meeting each person with an open heart, uh, bringing our wholeness to each event, this is where we have a chance to meet joy in the midst of suffering, you know. We can always stop and look up at the trees. I've been doing that a lot lately because the buds are coming out. We have so little control over so many things. I have no control over what people think of me. I have very little control over what happens. What I can't make anyone else do anything. I can't force myself to feel more pleasure or avoid pain. And I can't protect myself from loss. I can't protect my daughter from her own uh, path in life. You know, she'll... She's had to confront those things herself, knowing that I was always there for her, but we can't even protect the people we love from pain, you know. 
And yet, and this might be true of you too, when I look back, some of the things that seemed so, so devastating at the time, you know, losing this path or um, failing at a job, I look back and I say, well, that led me to my truer path. You know, that thing that that felt like a failure led me onward to where I was really supposed to be. And, and I've even sometimes felt that not getting what I wanted was really quite a blessing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so what does this mean that, that I have some control over how I react to the world? Am I attached to certain experiences and constantly grasp at those? And do I desperately seek to, to avoid other experiences that I don't think are going to be so great? Do I reject in other words, or avoid other kinds of experience. And then, um, you know, sometimes I can go into a kind of downward spiral in my thinking, and that will cover color everything I see. You know, I might get into a place where disappointment and resentment cover color everything that I experience. I can ask, what, help, what happens to my state of mind when somebody praises me? Do I get all puffed up and f- feel this sort of artificial... Uh, pride, or if somebody insults me, am I dashed down and questioning myself? If we notice how we get caught and jerked around by these things, we might be able to be kinder and more compassionate to others and towards ourselves. Persephone disp- de- descends into the darkness, and interestingly, in the Greek myth, she's she's kidnapped and taken into Hades' world, but in the Roman version, she goes voluntarily because she thinks it will help other beings. That really intrigued me when I found that out. And having tasted the food of the dead, she must return to the land of the dead, now and then, even though she herself is immortal. And I can't help but think that this gives her compassion for other suffering beings. You know, the immortals, they could just stay up there on Mount Olympus and feel great about themselves, but Persephone had some idea about what we confront in the world. Wherever our dark places are, they are what align us with others, give us the ability in the heart, you know, to live for the benefit of all beings and to feel what other people feel. One time I asked my students, uh, what, what, would you, what kind of superpower would you like? So one kid said, I'd like to be invisible. Another kid said they'd like to have the power of flight. And Olivia looked up at me with her eyes bright. She said... I'd like to have the superpower of understanding other people's feelings. (laughs) She's probably a therapist today. (laughs) I read a book called, I don't know if you know this book, The Sociopath Next Door. And I was reading it because, well, there was a sociopath next door. (laughs) And uh, at the end of the book, the author said that those, this is so, was such a revelation to me and so helpful to me. At the end of the book, the author, forget the name, said that those individuals to whom empathy is a closed door, so a sociopath is someone who thinks only of themselves, has no understanding of other people's feelings, that those individuals for whom empathy is a closed door are worthy of our compassion. She pointed out that to have the ability to feel things deeply gives us a rich and varied life, friends, understanding, wisdom. And these things are not available to those who cannot feel or understand other people's pain. Persephone also returns to the light. She's not condemned, and we're not condemned, to hang out in hell forever. You know, there's a couple sayings about hell, that if you're going through hell, keep going. (laughs) And that... (laughs) And that spirit, you know, religion is for people who don't want to go to hell, and spirituality is for those who've been there and don't want to go back. Um, I like both of those quotes. So we make friends with the dark, and we don't need to feel we failed when the darkness comes around. But we don't need to identify with it, with it to the extent that it defines or limits our whole life. In the grip of strong emotions, when I'm feeling sad or lost or vulnerable or unjustly blamed for something or misunderstood. You know, when I'm at my lowest, I can stop 
and offer that feeling to the whole world and, and to all human beings who at that moment are feeling exactly the way I do. In Tibetan practices, it's called Tonglen, where we, we offer something to the world, but we bring in all the suffering of the world and transform it within us. You know, um, I can feel my alliance with all beings. You know, I just pictured the Pieta uh, with the adult Jesus on her lap, Michelangelo's statue. And incidentally, may you know that that, maybe you know that beautiful statue was attacked by a mentally ill man with a hammer. What did that symbolize to him, you know? But when I saw that, I saw that statue in, I think it's in Rome. Um, I, I was a long way from being a mother myself, but I thought Mary understands our suffering, you know? Mary understands uh, because of what she suffered to her son. She understands our suffering. That's an archetype we can reach out to. The Virgin of Guadalupe has been very important to me. When my daughter had some life-threatening health problems, I would ask the Virgin of Guadalupe to look out for her for me. I'm surprised I'm telling you this because it's kind of very personal, but um, I never told my daughter that, but she started collecting images of the Virgin of Guadalupe, and that became an important uh, archetype for her as well. So when I'm feeling uh, at a loss, I can feel this alliance with all beings and be grateful that whatever I'm feeling or going through means I'm a human being, another suffering person (coughs) who needs help and has help to offer to others. I can feel my heart-to-heart connection with everyone who's been in hell, everyone who's ever suffered loss or sickness, and... I love this beautiful phrase from the Metta Sutta. I can wish that all beings be happy, that they be joyous and live in safety, that all beings be free from suffering. This is something I bring to mind when I hear a siren of any kind. Someone's in trouble when you hear a siren. And by the same token, when we're elated, when we're full of joy, when we're standing under a magnolia tree that's dripping with rain, you know, let's not just keep that feeling to ourselves. Let's offer it to the whole world, you know. Share that joy with all beings. Uh, and offer our pleasant pleasure and joy and our enlightenment to all beings without holding back. So this was that reminder that from that disembodied voice on the phone when my dad was dying, look for the jewels, you know. I want to share with you, um, in closing, a quote from Joel Achenbach. And this was his farewell letter. He used to be a columnist in the Chronicle. You know, sometimes we think spirituality is some amorphous, you know, mystical thing. But for me, this quote really brings it down to, to our human level. And Joel Achenbach said, Keep reminding yourself, every time you read a book, or take a class, or write a poem or watch a sunset, or teach something to a child, every time you love someone or find something beautiful, every time you advance, however incrementally, the cause of intelligent civilization, every time you pump a little warmth into this big, cold universe, you illustrate the real reason we are here. You solve the mystery. You don't need to ask any more you know the answer. I really love that. Well, thank you so much for your kind attention. Um, I'd love to hear from you now uh, how you practice with the darkness. Maybe there's a time in your life when you lost something that you found out later you didn't really need, you know, or you turned towards a new phase of your life with some trepidation and it ended up taking you to a new, a new realm. I hope something I've said, you know, has uh, reached you in some, some way in, in your own life. So um, the floor is open. Oh, and also welcome to those at home. Love to hear from you as well. There's quite a crowd of you out there. Rich has a question. Rich, go ahead, Rich. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rich. Uh, thank you, Laura, for my heart, especially for the laughter that you brought to us this morning. <laughs> um, Laura, I'm also a recovering drug addict, and I would like you like to request that you bring your insight to the intersection between loving kindness and crossing into the uh, region of codependence, mm -hmm. um, in, especially in dealing with another, I'm thinking of an addict in their disease, which I believe that you touched upon briefly in, in speaking to us. Uh, I'm also new to the practice of Buddhism, so how do you practice loving kindness when, you know, to to do so in a very, very literal sense would enable someone to deepen their behavior and their, their substance abuse? <laughs> wow, no pressure. <laughs> but that is a, that's a tall order. Uh, you know, we can offer loving, loving kindness to people from our full heart. Uh, without even saying anything to them, we can be prepared to offer them our our loving kindness and our own strength. And especially if you've been in the thrall of addiction yourself, you can offer your own experience, strength, and hope to that person. You know, one one thing about Buddhism is when I came to Zen Center, I thought it was all about dropping my story, and that might be part of it. But in recovery, I needed to retrieve my story so that I could share it with other suffering people and help them see how I came into recovery myself. But, Rich, you know very well yourself that you can't make anybody else get sober. And so um, it's so important to have very clear boundaries with people who are still trapped in their addiction. You know, there's a saying, now how can you tell if an addict's lying? their lips are moving <laughs> because we, we tend to lie about addiction whether it's to food or porn or you know um, uh, alcohol or drugs whatever it is we tend to lie about it because we don't feel great about it and yet we want to indulge in it so having really clear boundaries and you know if you if you don't have a problem with addiction but you have a friend who does and if they're struggling recovery, don't use in front of them. Don't have your glass of wine when they're there. That would be a very kind thing to do. You don't need to do that right now. You know, so um, you have to understand. You know, Rich, what I love about Buddhism is that the Buddha taught that the cause of our suffering is craving, and the Sanskrit word for that is tanha, which means thirst. So those of us who struggle with alcohol have a very literal understanding of that. Uh, the Metta Sutta is something you can chant every day. And, and Rich, I wrote this book about Buddhism and recovery. I have a few copies with me um, today. And the, the Metta Sutta is in the back of that book. And that's something I chant every day uh, because it reminds me of the path that I want to walk. Uh, so I, I hope that's helpful, Rich. I, I do think you're talking about a, a lifetime of practice. But maybe, maybe those of us who are in recovery, because we know what it's like to be addicted, can have firmer boundaries with people who are struggling while still offering them our open-hearted support. So thank you for that question. Anyone else? Yeah, exploring an idea. So, um, codependency and co-arising. Mm -hmm. So, the exploration is um, where, how, how am I aware of myself in the interaction with the other, mm -hmm. and how much uh, do I want to reaffirm? an image of myself by helping that other and having them fit uh -huh. my image yeah. so that I feel I'm a good person <laughs> for reaching out. Yes. Where in co-arising, it feels to me that I just, I have presented to this opportunity mm -hmm. to inter interact, but I have no the practice of not um, solidifying sort of my story or my image or my in the interaction. So yeah. how do I stay empty 
in that practice and still reach out to hear that suffering in the world. Yeah, that's a wonderful point. I feel like when we sit, we don't think very much is happening. And yet what it gives us is uh, what I've heard called the sacred pause. So in relation to other people, rather than reacting out of our instinctual self, that defensive reptilian brain that wants to defend us, you know, we can pause and, and literally ask ourselves, what could I say right now that's most helpful? And so, uh, you know, but by sitting, we start to, we know ourselves in a very intimate way. And we can call ourselves on our own BS as well. So I love that you brought up the point that, um, what, are, what is my motivation here? Am I trying to prove I'm a good person? Do I want everybody to look up to me? Do I want applause right now? Or am I helping this person out of, out of an understanding that I too am a suffering being and I can be with you in your suffering? You know, as soon as we put ourselves above other people with a kind of misguided uh, or s- sentimental kind of sympathy, we're not helping them at all. And, and most people that have come into recovery get a lot more help from another addict or alcoholic who's been there than from a, a therapist or a parent or a doctor or somebody that's telling you, look, you're killing yourself. You need to stop doing this. So I, I do feel like this great gift of practice of sitting still, it, it helps us know ourselves better, understand our motivations better, and we can laugh at ourselves about it. I think I've told you guys a story before where I came out of Zen Center and I saw this guy sleeping on the front steps of Zen Center and I thought, I'm going to go home and make him breakfast. Aren't I wonderful? You know, so I went home and I scrambled some eggs and put them on a paper plate, made some coffee, paper cup, brought it back to Zen Center, just feeling great about myself. And he was just waking up and I leaned over and I said, excuse me, I brought you some breakfast. And he looked at the plate, and he looked up at me, and he said, You got any salt? (laughs) You know, I realized, I I said, well, I did did salt the eggs. But in that moment, I knew that I was being Lady Bountiful. (laughs) Oh, you poor creature, I'm going to help you, because I have more than you do, you know. And I went home a humble person, you know. um, (laughs) Something else. Yes, Grisha. Um, thank you. I love connecting to your um, recovery and talk, um, also recovery as you know, and a teacher. You know, and and uh, this idea of the dark and the light and the sacred pause. And I think that's really ultimately why I meditate is to try to lengthen that sacred pause or to remember to do it. Um, I forget all the time. And um, there's a saying in recovery too that for every year sober, that you, uh, for every year sober, you get one extra second uh, between the moment something happens and you react to it. (laughs) So, I've been sober now for 34 years, and you would think, (laughs) I don't know if I would think, because apparently I have 34 seconds. (laughs) Um, And so much happens in a school day, as you know, Um, so much dark and so much light in one in one hour of a school with 22 children and, ad- and administrators walking around and therapists and, you know, there's so much that happens. And um, the dark for me, ha- there's, a dark, there's a dark moment every day when, I've, when I'm angry at myself for how I reacted yeah. or how I responded to a child's behavior, to my principal walking in the room, you know, ugh. So it, it's just frustrating. I'm just venting the frustration of like no matter how much we practice <laughs> that's like, right I mean no matter how much we practice and no, ma- how, no matter how sober we are no matter how long we've taught we're going to snap at a kid when we're stressed and um, one thing I found that really helped me a lot was to, to, to make a joke out of it you know instead of like I couldn't stand it when kids would poke me with their finger to get my attention. So I'd say, you know what? That's my pet peeve number one thousand three hundred and twenty-two. Please don't poke me. You know, I, you do have a choice sometimes to make light of it. Uh, but you know what really blew my third graders' minds was when I would apologize to them, and it made a big impression on them that an adult, wow, an adult could make a mistake. But then, 
sincerely say they were sorry. You know, gee, I'm really sorry I snapped at you. I was just impatient, and, and that wasn't fair. You know, that can make a big impression on a, on a kid. But I think we have to be gentle with ourselves that we are going to respond in, in uh, inappropriate ways sometimes. And, uh, you know, I try to say, oh, come on, honey, you can, you can do better than that. You know, just speak kindly to yourself when you're, when you're not living up to your own standards. You know, I had an amazing experience. I was at Kaiser, and I uh, needed a procedure done, and, and the technician came into my room, and he held up his name tag. He was Saji. And I said, uh, wow, as soon as you say that name, I picture this little kid that was in the, my class, the first year I ever taught, 1986. And um, he said, really? That's it. Saji's a really unusual name. Was your student Palestinian? I said, yeah. He said, what school was that? He said, Alvarado Elementary. He said, Mrs. B, you were my teacher. (laughs) And he's 45 years old and has three kids of his own. And what was so touching was he he said he felt so honored to be able to help me with this procedure the way I'd helped him when he was little. And, you know, if you have an experience like that, when somebody says to you, I'll never forget when you said, of course, I always braced myself, like, oh, God, what did I say? (laughs) But um, we don't know how we affect other people. And the children, you know, the children we teach, we don't know what they carry into the world for them, with with them. And we, we, we might have affected them in some negative ways, but I think every time I see one of my former students, it's, it's just so moving to me to see this, this beautiful adult who remembers me and remembers our time together in third grade. It's very touching. Do you run into your students sometimes? Yeah. It's very touching. And when that happens, I say, I did a good thing teaching kids. That was a good thing. How are we doing on time? We're out of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much. I really love coming here and being with you. So thank you for inviting me. Do we have announcements? Do we have a host? We do have a host, and it's me. And uh, there are snacks out on the table, a nice array. I've got some citrus, a chocolate, uh, a make uh, a make a trail mix, um, and cheese. Uh, I will also be carrying around the Donna Bowl. Donna is falling for generosity, and it's through your generosity and the folks at home, or and the folks at home, uh, that uh, we're able to rent the space um, and uh, send out our newsletter, which uh, goes out primarily to incarcerated uh, uh, persons. Uh, there is a, uh, where else does, a, does your generosity go to? I think it is. Oh, oh, and the speakers, yes, the speakers. <laughs> and uh, in the middle of this, this space. And uh, there's a uh, sign up sheet uh, if you want to keep in touch through our newsletter uh, and uh, weekly announcements of our meetings uh, on the credenza out there. Um, there's coffee and tea uh, provided, uh, I mean, tea provided, and uh, when you're done with your cup, just put it in the sink, and I'll take care of it. Uh, often people meet uh, outside at 1230 to, to continue uh, their community uh, by going to lunch together. A couple of things. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you remember Jeffrey Schneider. Mm-hmm. I know he's a book. Do you know that he's died recently? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, That was one thing I wanted to make sure you knew. And then um, if you'd like, I have a few of my books with me. If you'd like one, please let me know, and I'll I'll, I'll sign it for you, except I forgot to bring a pen. But uh, I have those with me. Thank you. Anyone else? Is our retreat, retreat, uh, Jeff's got his, I'm sorry, Jeff. Hi. Our uh, retreat registrations are going along nicely, and... um, we're looking forward to uh, April 17th through 21st. Please join us if you can. Go to gaybluist.org slash retreats. Thank you, Jeffrey. That was my question. Are we sold out already? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Hey, what? 
Say the name of your book again because it's really good. And, uh, the, the Zen Way of Recovery, an illuminated path out of the darkness of addiction, which is, <laughs> I thought that was a little bit much, but that's what Chopala called it. <laughs> the Zen Way of Recovery, available widely. Anyone else? Should we gather together to get our dedication here? By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.